CBS defends its right not to stream to you. Facebook allows 1.5 billion people to broadcast live. What's the big deal with 4K video? And Netflix and the docu community fall deeply in love. All that and more on this week's edition of Hacking TV. I'm Steve Rosenbaum. And I'm Saul Hansel. Welcome back, Saul. I hope you had a fabulous Thanksgiving and I, the best Thanksgiving that Ohio has to offer. <laughs> and great you to hear Bob on the show and um, all of, you know, all was good. You know, I'd love to say that we had a quiet week, but the truth is it hasn't there may never be a quiet week in in our hacking world of video. It may just be a frothy week every week, which by the way is good for us. So we never we never have a shortage. Of, of things to talk about and topics to explore. This week in particular, though, I think is a little gnarlier than maybe some other weeks. Gnarlier? How, how so? Well, you know, this CBS thing. So Let me CBS. say this in the nicest way I can to our friends at the FCC. Yes. You know, the FCC is not motor vehicles, but it is a government agency. And the fact that they are in the middle of as many kind of inbound complex issues about how bandwidth is going to be fairly used and deployed in our world is not a little thing. It's like not a like this is not a government 101 problem they're facing. And Wheeler's a bright guy, but like I don't well, know. So let's back up and uh, and dissect whether this gnarly problem, which it certainly is. You know what's going on here. So the FCC is looking at how broadcast and cable networks ne uh, negotiate with cable systems. There is supposed to be a good faith negotiation under a law that, under some circumstances, al um, allows the, the broadcasters who have been, you know, for 75 years broadcasting for free to charge money for their programs from the cable systems and then by extension from the consumers. And there's all kinds of nuances to those deals. And one of the more interesting twists is as additional pressure the broadcasters can put on the cable network, or cable systems, not cable networks, is they could, they could do what CBS did two years ago and say, hey, Time Warner subscribers, we're not only cutting off CBS on Time Warner Cable, we're cutting off CBS streaming on Time Warner Cable's internet system. And the FCC is saying, you know, are you sure you should be able to do that? And this week, CBS wrote a very tart response. Local broadcast stations have a duty to transmit programming for free over the air they have no obligation to make any of that programming or any other content uh, content available online. Do you? It sounds like you agree with them that the FCC should not get involved in any of this. No, it's not that I agree with them or don't agree with them. I mean, you know, I don't have a law degree. It's what I'm saying is this is 300 level complicated stuff, and you know, every week it seems like we have another issue that ends up kind of, you know, either direct line to the FCC or dotted line to the FCC. I mean, last week we were talking about T-Mobile, you know, and you were, you know, saying, you know, the FCC has to take a hard look at this, you know, whole, you know, um, um, what was it, the whole, you know, be able to consume all of the, the content you want via T-Mobile and don't get charged for bandwidth issue. And now we have another FCC issue. And I guess all I'm saying is, even if they have a room full of really smart lawyers, like they have to be a little bit like, kind of just weary of having the end like it's like can't you guys just work this out you know there's a little bit of a you know it seems like everything is going to be a battle at the at the FCC stand, l level at this point the FCC has long been that way because it is regulating for a long time monopolies or oligopolies it's actually more interesting now in a way because the internet you have a small number of very concentrated players plus everybody else. And getting a set of rules that works for everybody is complicated, particularly with the amount of lobbying. I mean, the amount, you know, the Comcasts and the um, AT&Ts of the world spend many, many, many millions of dollars a year putting enormous pressure on the FCC. 
Um, and to my mind, there is a crying need for the government to come up with a set of fair rules in this oligopolistic world. Um, and I think that one thing we know about where government is and isn't useful is that antitrust type rules, you know, fighting the effects of concentration of power is often a legitimate function of government. And so the question is, is power too concentrated in the cable systems or the or the programming networks? But, but to be fair, that horse has already left the barn. I mean, you know, there's not going to be a lot of tough negotiations between the Comcast owned and operated cable networks and the Comcast cable system. And, you know, I mean that. So so really, we're talking about tough negotiations between a, a handful of big entities. Yes, we are. Although, um, Although CBS the story really that, you know, within the Time Warner conglomerate, once upon a time, that Warner Brothers Studio wanted a billion dollars from Time Warner Cable to use the Roadrunner name. I'm not so sure that intra-company negotiations are always um, easier than inter-company I just want to say for the record, if any time Hacking TV's enterprise wants to have the podcast give the video broadcast a billion dollars, I'd be okay with that. Um, okay. We could just, just pass that billion dollars between the entities. Um, there we go. We, 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 yeah. can, we, we what, clearly what? now have a billion dollars of revenue. We can go public. By the way, um, one more thing just before we go past the CBS thing. Let's not forget that CBS is also – embroiled in, you know, the Sumner Redstone, you know, competency hearing that's coming up and a lot of question about net net where Viacom slash CBS is going to be at the end of the end of the day. I mean, it's I mean, there's going to be some kind of a change of control in that company. You mean Sumner's not going to live forever? And you know, he's he's pretty darn close to living forever. But in any case, we don't we let's I, I and no one would wish him a day less than than you know than than the universe is ready for him to continue to manage his you know his enterprises. But but that that being said, you know, I, I think you'll see a change in in the dynamic between CBS and Viacom and the rest of the world at some point in the not terribly distant future well, as well. If we very you know appreciatively imagine a post Sumner Redstone world what do you imagine CBS and Viacom are are different after uh, in the next phase? Um, I think that the company has operated enormously conservatively and moved relatively slowly in digital. And I think a new CEO or the current CEO, but with more CEO like powers will um will make would you know i think going back to the deal to them suing youtube slash google a lot of their executives have had both arms tied behind their back about how to grow in digital when the company has a position that it's still kind of anti-digital and so i think in the next chapter you'll see a lot of changes maybe some asset sale maybe some reorganization but in any case just a a a more digitally active company. They have nowhere to go but up. Exactly um, correct. Um, speaking of which, which brings yeah. us to Facebook, you know, you say a billion live streams. Do you really mean that? Well, no. Facebook has a billion and a half monthly users, and they are starting to roll out on their various apps the ability <laughs> to, you know, at some uh, degree to compete with Periscope and so on to push a button and broadcast live um, from wherever you are to your followers. Um, they've, they've been testing this with celebrities, but now they're rolling it out to everybody. Um, they think it's going to be most useful for birthday parties and, in their examples, reaching the summit of the mountain. And you can tell everybody, you can broadcast live from the top of the Matterhorn or something like that. I don't know whether that's a big deal, but it's uh, Facebook has a pretty damn big footprint. So, 
I've been trying to get into the data for this thing. And if anyone's listening and they've got a special secret backdoor relationship with Facebook, feel free to uh, lend me a solid here because I've been trying to get my my name verified with the little blue check mark next to it. And I've, I've you know, taken my fingerprints and blood samples and sent them copies of my driver's license and all manner of things and have not been able to get verified, which has been the thing that you needed to have in order to uh, – to get the live stream. But how many uh, counterfeit Steve Rosenbaums are there out there? There's mm. at least one that has a very different kind of kind of political point of view than I do. And uh, he and I often get confused for one another. But my, my point was not my my issue. It was that I've been watching uh, Andrew Wallenstein from Variety has, has been testing the live stream on Facebook. And I can't figure out like so that you broadcast it live and it sa- and it gives you a little alert and it says Andrew's live but then it seems to be available after that as a show it doesn't go away well that i mean i am very cynical about live because i don't think we live in a world where people want to watch um stuff when you want them to watch people want to watch stuff when they want to watch and anytime i've talked to anybody who has done a live event uh, in terms of webcasting, 95% of the traffic is the on-demand later. It's, um, I mean, there are exceptions, puppy cams, some sports and so on, but basically um, live is more of a production method in a lot of ways. We try and do our show in one take, so we, we could easily put this out live more or less sort of. Um, but it's, I don't know. I, yeah. I, I, I don't see it as a big deal. Uh, but there is a psychological magic. I don't know. What, I mean, if you could go live on Facebook, what would you do? So, so Gary V is doing, is doing a, a lot of live. I, you know, I, I think, I think it's a little sexy to think something might, like I could be part of a happening. I, I get it. I get it. I think, I think the bigger question for Facebook is going to be, you know, with a billion potential live streams, you don't need very many of your users to be doing bad behavior in order for it to get, you know, really, you know, potentially advertiser hostile really quick, whether that's, you know, pornography or bad language or hate speech or, I mean, I just think, I don't know how you police that, but. The same way you police YouTube, but faster. Um... Yeah, I mean, Yes. I mean, the answer is somebody can, and unlike, for example, Twitter, where you can just spin up another account and, you know, be objectionable. I think Facebook does a better job of kind of real identity at the outset. So you could mess up your account if you put up stuff there that that you get. My guess is you'll get banned pretty quickly. So. And, you know, the, the Internet is the Internet. People are people. At some level, if you're Facebook, you have to let most everybody say most of the things that occur to them because you're connecting everybody to everybody. Um, And it's not Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Uh, Having said that, you know, I've been seeing a stream of increasingly sharply worded and often adversarial conversations on my news feed about politics and thinking to myself, really? Like, uh, you know, how, how do I dial that down? Can I dial down the level of political rhetoric in my newsfeed? Thank you very much, because I kind of would like to see more puppy videos, if that's possible. <laughs> that, you know, the mysteries of the Facebook equation is, you know, and, and how to give people any control over it is one of the, you know, questions of our age. Um, but, let you know, so if do you think, and let me ask the um, our... You know, growing audience out there. Does anybody want us to broadcast this live? Go send us an email um, to hackers at hackingtv.news if you want this live, and we'll try and do that if there's enough people and Steve can get the technology to work. Um, yeah, g- good luck with that. We're okay. we're we're fumfering along in our little production studio du jour. So, all right, but but let's talk tech because you know you. You uh, you raised an interesting question at the top of the show about 4K, and you know you've been 
historically quite cynical about VR, and you, you, you enjoyed calling it 3D with great relish. I did? Yeah, you said, is it another 3D or something? Oh, I see. Yeah. So, and... So, so, so is four, is, I mean, are you putting 4K in the same bucket? All I know is, I, you know, there's a series of releases. The news of, of that caught my eye, which is not a big deal, is Vimeo is now adding 4K. And, you know, Netflix, where I understand, you know, you might want a cinematic experience, has it, YouTube. And I'm just trying to figure out who the hell cares, right? Is 4K on most of the screens that people use any better than HD, which is what, 2K if you were going to use the same measurement? So, so two answers to that. You know, you could say the same thing about digital still cameras and megapixels. Yes, you can, and many people do. I mean, you go to Best Buy and there's a 20 megapixel camera and a 25 megapixel camera and the 25 megapixel camera is a couple dollars more and you go, I guess I need more megapixels because more is better, right? And, and you know, there's a Sony camera that I was actually looking at today and, you know, one of the problems Sony's having selling this particular camera is that even though it has less megapixels, it actually has better image quality than the one model below it, but nobody believes them. So 4K may fall into that category from a sales standpoint. From a, from a picture standpoint, here's what I'll tell you. Um, I was in a friend of mine's living room three months ago in which he had a 4K projector and an extraordinary surround sound system and I've never seen anything remotely like it. It was mind-boggling. Gorgeous. No doubt. But th how many people who watch things on Vimeo are going to play them back through that sort of um, system? I mean, you know, yes, if you're going to watch, you know, some fancy movie and you can get it in super high resolution, great. But I don't... Um, did, did you buy a Blu-ray player? No. Me neither. Skip, okay. Skipped a whole generation of I have DVDs. a 720p TV set, but everybody watches their movies on their phones. So... Um, uh, but, but, but I'll say this. Um, all right, here. A little blatant self-promotion for one second. So please. Waywire, uh, the company that I'm CEO of, was just chosen by CES to power their entire video backend for the CES show in Vegas this January. Congratulations. It's, it's an enormous win for us, but it has me even more geeked out on hardware than I would ordinarily be. And I can tell you, you know, 4K is not going away. It's not 3D. You're going to see a move to 4K screens. You're going to see a move to 4K cameras. You're going to see, you know, the iPhone uh, 6S already records 4K. Um, uh, 4, 4K is here to stay. Well, wait, 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 the on, nature on, more rhymes a little bit. Of course bit. it is. It rhymes because... a little bit. Why not, right? Um, I mean, you know, whatever HD cost three years ago, 4K costs now in terms of chips because that's just the way Moore's Law works. So why not make it, you know, as good as you can? On the other hand, there is a question of diminishing return. I'll, t I'll tell you one footnote I saw in one of the articles about this that was interesting, which is the web streaming standard that they're using for streaming 4K apparently has other stuff built into it that make for a better experience with less buffering, um, even at lower resolution. So it is an upgrade, no matter how big your screen is and how fast your connection is, and that sounds good to me. Look, HTML5 video is extraordinary, and we are seeing finally the end of you know, Flash video. It really is now kind of at the end of its useful life. And, and you know, the truth is, you know, we live in a in a moment of miracles when you can take a tiny little video from your phone and press a button and it appears on the size of your wall on a flat screen. That's pretty, you know, it's pretty extraordinary. Indeed it is. So, a uh, quick story, sign of the times, I guess two stories, sign of the times. One, some ad agency or media company went and asked a bunch of marketers, where are you going to put your... Super Bowl related ads in addition to on the Super Bowl. And not surprisingly, th four out of five said Facebook and seven out of 10 said YouTube. But interest um, interestingly, three out of 10 said Snapchat. 
that's, you know, considering that Snapchat wasn't in the media business a year ago, they were just person to person. The fact that they are, you know, have got a 30% share of mind in the biggest advertising party of the year shows that the thoroughly wacky, but maybe very savvy strategy they have to completely change their business might be working. Or is it just media buyers of a certain age saying, what are the kids doing? You know, they go home and their teenage, you know, their preteen and teenage kids say, I'm on Snapchat. And they go, all right, well, let's move some media money over there. I mean, is it, uh, is it, is it brilliant media buying or is it just reflexive media buying? I don't think I know the answer to that. I mean, uh, is there a CPM that you can, you know, attribute back to the number of people that see you on Snapchat? I don't know whether they're, you know, ultimately there will be whether they can get the cool new kid on the block premium for a little bit longer, you know, um, they may well be able to. Um, but I, you know, the, f the fact that nobody thinks, you know, I, t I talked to my 13 year old daughter who uses Snapchat a little bit and it's like, does do these video clips have anything to do with what you use Snapchat for? No. Do you watch them? Sometimes because they're sort of in my face, right? So the just like Reed Hastings went and turned a, a DVD by mail service into a streaming network, Snapchat is turning a social discussion service, you know, privacy oriented, which has no revenue stream whatsoever, into a media distribution platform. If that really holds that's a pretty nifty business you know pivot so 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 let's talk about netflix for just a second because uh, a, a big thing happened and i think it's worth you know just giving them their props so uh, the international documentary association uh, is a terrific organization full of hard-working serious passionate documentary filmmakers who have been scraping along trying to figure out how to make a living as the audience for documentaries on television pivots to reality TV and theaters don't play documentaries unless they're big films. And 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 there was an honor given to Ted Sarandos uh, earlier this week. Ted Sarandos, the head chief content officer of Netflix. Right. Essentially and the honor because of the organization on which you are a board member was was a board member, not, a board not, member. not we'll keep trustee, not any longer, but it was for years. Uh -huh. um, and and they gave him an award essentially saying, you know, Netflix has been an extraordinary friend to documentary. And if you think about it and you look at their history, it's really quite true. And what are, so when you look at what impresses you most about what Sarandos and Netflix have done, what is it? They've taken real risks, They you know, it's easy to take big celebrity film maker, you know, with big name, either hosts or presenters and put that on a network and call yourself a hero. But if you look at, you know, for example, the film Beast of Donation, I mean, that's not a happy film. That's not a, you know, I mean, that's a hard topic. And it remind me, what is the topic of that? You know, without getting into it, because we're going to run out of time, it's a doc about what's going on uh, in, in, you know, in a faraway land that, that American viewers would ordinarily not be exposed to on the evening news. And, and Sarandos, he, he, he buys real films, they promote them, you know, they pay fairly, um, and, and the documentary community um, has come to really love Netflix for that. And I think... And how would you control... HBO has also been a buyer of documentaries. Um, how would you compare what Netflix is doing to what HBO has done? That's an interesting question. I mean, Sheila Nevins, had, for, for a period of time, was the only buyer of, of complicated you know, documentaries. And I think you know, Netflix has, has simply created another outlet. Um, the difference is that on HBO, you know, you, you, they might buy your film and pay you for it, but you could still end up on HBO 2 at 4 in the morning. And Netflix, because it's on demand, you know, your, your audience can find your film when they want to find it. And with a little bit of marketing help, um, 
I don't have data to back this up, but I just have a sense that probably, you know, and I don't know whether the economics are identical or not. My guess is probably HBO pays a little bit more and Netflix probably reaches more people if you're a documentary filmmaker. That's very, a to total guess. Very interesting. Um, so last story today, um, we're just going to mark the um, retirement of Linda Ellerby, who, I don't know about you, but was a hero of mine uh, as I was growing up, you know, most notable for her early 80s show with Lloyd Dobbins, NBC News Overnight, which proved that if the boss isn't awake, good people can do great stuff on television. So I love her work. Um, I actually, we in one of my earlier incarnations at a different company, uh, managed a whole bunch of travel and, and logistics for one of her uh, um, uh, films. I had kind of a funny reaction to, to the word of her retirement, though, which was almost intuitively I thought to myself, if she is now of an age where she literally is ready to step off the stage, how is it possible that there is no one else that's filled that role in the last 20 years. Well, she, she after, you know, being on NBC News, um, she's been basically doing documentaries for Nickelodeon for the last 20 years, which are, is a great noble thing to do, but it's not necessarily the center of her profession. She's somebody who knows how to write. But, and, why, is, but why is Nick News, why, why is it that in her retirement, it seems like we're going to leave a gaping hole in smart, well-produced, well-written young people's storytelling around issues that matter. Why is that? That's bad, right? It's bad. Well, unless you would call um, Vice the uh, filling in the gap. Wow. Okay. Does Vice replace where Linda Ellerby drops off? That's that, we could do a whole show on that question. I I, I don't think so. I think Linda Ellerby is a is a much younger target demo. I think Nickelodeon device. There's probably a a little bit of a valley in between those two. There's a occasional history of very good kids documentaries. Walter Cronkite did so, you know there were some when I was growing up. Um, most of our audience will have to go Google who Walter Cronkite is, but anyway, um, it's you know it's a rare thing and it has mostly been when there's somebody who it already has celebrity cashed. But I don't think, I mean, I think that the way people think about TV now, this sort of chipper young thing TV host is entirely incompatible with, you know, good writing and, you know, good storytelling for people of any age. Let, 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 let's make sure we leave this on the note we want to leave it on, though. Linda's, Linda's provided an enormous service to the industry. And you're right, the Lloyd Dobbins show made me smile the minute you said it, because, of course, it was spectacular. And the work that she did at Nickelodeon as well. And uh, she deserves all the accolades that she's going to get. And my brief cynicism about the fact that there's not another Linda Ellaby notwithstanding you know, she's a, she is a Well, it, it's talent. a tribute to her. Yeah. So we end this week's uh, Hacking TV podcast as Linda has ended um, Overnight and all of her other stuff. And so it goes. And so it goes. See you next week, Saul. Keep on hacking.